I think that, you know, my kids need the best shot at being happy and successful and whatever they want to be for the rest of their life. And, like, that means that if they're, you know, whatever. Welcome to the Two Cent Dad podcast, where we interview dads to discuss their journeys of intentional fatherhood while doing work they care about and living a life of purpose. I'm your host, Mike Sudik. Yeah, had some sick kids, and I'm sure you can uh, understand. That's time of the year. <laughs> yeah, you're. Um, you guys are homeschooling, is that right? Yeah, we homeschool. Yeah, so cool. That's really just, uh, awesome. Yeah, I love how that's kind of like a my wife. thing. To a, um, it went from like almost like a, um, oh, like why is that weird? Like why are they, uh, why why are they doing that? To like wow, yeah. like impressive like it went from this thing that was looked down upon to this thing that was venerated and like that yeah why do you think that is like what changed about that public perception just like everybody had to do it right and they're like okay like this is uh if i you know if i had to do this it would be it it would be such a decision on my part um that it, it would require so much of me and i never really thought about it before but it's clear that I can teach my kids much faster than the schools are teaching them. Um, yeah. And like now, um, so I don't know, everybody else who went back to public school, like we did, like, you know, we were, okay, mm-hmm. well, we were home from school. Now we're going back. We're like, geez, like if we had nothing else to do in life, uh, yeah. we, we know that we would be able to give our kids a better education right now mm-hmm. than they're getting. Yeah. yeah. Not like you don't have anything else to do. But, uh, so, so the ability, <laughs> the ability to make that, uh, decisive, to, like to make that decision to, to choose yeah. that you're going to elevate, uh, you know, your children and their education to that level, uh, even with all the sacrifices that it entails, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty big yeah. and impressive. So when you get that home, that homestead that you've been eyeing, and then are you guys going to flip to homeschool, just move out of the country? Like, um. Like Joe Norman. <laughs> uh, right. Possibly. So there's another guy I follow, Adam Rossi. I don't know if you see him on, on Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah but he's sure. like very much make, like make the money and get out. Like make the money yeah, and move yeah. to the country. Like money, yeah. country, money, country. And so he uh, sold his business and you know, he lives out in gets got a couple hundred acres and he's like a kid with uh, like a rector sets and an unlimited budget. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I did. Uh, I met Joe Norman through a, he was a teacher in, he was an instructor, like a guest lecturer in that uh, homesteading course that you might've seen. Okay. That I yeah. Took, yeah. Uh, from Rizoma field school. So yeah. that's, uh, I've definitely thought uh, about it enough about moving to the country that you know, I took that course and, uh, we decided best plan was to focus on business, focus yeah. on family, and then sharpen skills. So, like this year yeah. was a big gardening year for us. We finally took it seriously enough to, you yeah. know, learn and and yield a crop, a little little miniature tomato crop, things like that. That's so. cool. Tell me about that course. I'm really curious. Can you give me like the couple minute? Oh, like, it's really cool. I uh, highly yeah. recommend that to anyone who's like thinking about it. You know, she's building this cloud community of people who all are coming to it for, uh, you know, different personal reasons, but very similar, like concerns. Everybody's like, huh, like, you know, it doesn't seem like the experts are in charge or if they, you know, if the experts, the experts are in charge, like maybe I shouldn't be relying on them. You know, the same people who kind of let things completely hit the fan and like send my kids home from school and all these other things that I never would have imagined they would do in a million years. Like they're also saying that my electricity is going to be fine, that, you know, the, mm-hmm. uh, energy production isn't something that I should worry about. And, you know, maybe it would be nice to have a backup plan. So it was really cool in this divided political world to see all of these. There were a lot of like people on the left, um, a lot of like people who maybe weren't so political. And then like, there were like a lot of like people on the right and they all had the same plan, which was like, we should, um, generate, uh, not like build our knowledge base, uh, and build a community. And so, yeah. It's really a, like we were in the inaug- inaugural class. I think she's done two other cohorts of it now, but mm-hmm. uh, it, w- it was just like really uh, beneficial. And you could see all these people m- meeting up in real life. And mm-hmm. that was, you know, the beginnings of taking this cloud community and making it a physical one. And I think yeah. Balaji talks about this all the time, right? Yeah. You know, you're going to build this like uh, digital 
nation first and then eventually once you have this digital nation you're going to have a physical nation to accompany the people who have joined this digital nation yeah does he talk about that in his network state book because i haven't read that one i mean i know i haven't read it yet either uh i did the pre-order i assume it's come out now uh but no he's been talking about this just on twitter and and his blog for a long time now yeah so, so the end game of people that were in that cohort were to gain knowledge and gain connections or that was like, that's what the purpose was that she put out. But I mean, wh- when you talk about people that were in there from different backgrounds, I assume that yeah. they also had different objectives going into that. Or was it similar of like, Hey, we're kind of wanting to just explore how to some of these ideals, you know? Yeah. So everybody was in different stages. My wife and I have a, a house in the suburbs in a town that uh, you know, until a few years ago, uh, we thought was where we were going to die. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe we still will, right. Like who knows the future. Um, but other people had just bought a farm. Other people had just like moved out nowhere. Other people were living in New York city and they, they were yeah. thinking that, you know, maybe they would like to, to do this in three to five years. And so it went all the way through land selection to, you know, very specific things about, raising uh, crops and raising um, animals. And it gave you a lot of tools. Uh, so there was a reading list that uh, I was not able to keep up with, but you know, I was able to buy these books and we're slowly working through them. Yeah. Um, but the main lesson was it has to be, you have to base yourself around community, um, yeah. you know, to, to keep uh, a camp of people uh, or a, a house safe from uh the, the rest of the world, if the rest of the world yeah. desires you not to be safe, you know, you probably need what uh, a small military base would need, which is maybe 3000 people to guard it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the, the real way to uh, prepare for any coming you know, apocalypse is not really to, to, to prepare yourself, it's to prepare your neighbors and, and yeah. to get and to find people who are either like minded or, you know, talk with these, uh, these people that you would otherwise uh, that you're that you're surrounded by anyway, no man is an yeah. island. So yeah. It was a good good lesson in that course. That's cool. I feel like we could talk all day about that, so <laughs> but maybe yeah. we should start it. Right. Yeah. How long have you so, been doing this? You what's that? How long have you been doing Two Cent Dad? So Two Cent Dad started about five years ago. Um so it started because I was starting to take over my dad's business, which is a software development company that we do we build teams out of our offices in India. So we're based in Michigan, but we work with a lot of SaaS businesses that are a lot of very like unsexy businesses that are needing to scale up and they can't hire and retain. And, and, and so we, we build them teams that come right alongside their in-house team. So anyways, I was, um, taking that over and, and I was like, how do I, how do I balance this desire to grow this thing now that is like, I really believe in and want to grow. And I want to have an in- intentional family and had young family. Sure. And I, I didn't find any content that really spoke to me. It was a lot of people that were all about business or it was, it was stay-at-home dads. Just fine if you're stay-at-home dad, it just wasn't the, where yeah. I was at, right? So um, I wanted to talk to people that were trying to balance that, you know? And yeah. buddy of mine's like, just start a podcast and just like cold email these people. And so I did. It happened to be a lot of people in tech initially and then just kind of branched out to interesting people that are dads that I want to talk with and, and hear about the yes. cool things they're doing. So, yeah. It's very like unintentional, Joe. Like I, I, I didn't really have a strategy for it because I just wanted to have these conversations, and I'm trying to reboot it a little bit and take it a little more seriously. Um, I'm still flushing that out a little bit, so open to feedback and yeah. any questions. I think so. I think that uh, it, this is great. What's the downside? Uh, let's yeah. let's uh, let's keep on seeing. I'm ha- happy. To, I'm gonna definitely listen to some of the other episodes. Um, yeah. but I, I think that you're hitting a cross section of people that, uh, are not talking about fatherhood, um, yeah. and they're not talking about, uh, the, you know, the, the people that are your target audience are not seeking to talk about this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the good ones anyway, uh, I think, uh, like there's a lot of people who like would like to generate, uh, content, you know, uh, 12 hours a day on it. Um, but I would, uh, you know, maybe the, you know, it's, it's like somebody running for office, right? Like the people who are uh, aspiring to, to run for office are also those who I trust the least to obtain it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody's like doing like eight, 10 hours a day on Instagram and TikTok, like maybe uh, maybe their parenting advice uh, one should take with a, a, a grain of salt. Right, right. Yeah. 
That's the, that's a good point. The harder uh, a guest is to get, the better their information may be presumed yes. to be uh, before yes. they they come on your podcast. So that's an interesting point um, because I've had people reach out that are like very very active and they're like, oh, I sell these things online and I'm a dad and I want to come on you and I'm like. Those are really the people I least want on that are like really, really vying to be on. I'm like, I, I should be selling you and I should be excited about having you on. So not, exactly. not that I'm being egotistical about my podcast because it's just a tiny little podcast. But anyways, so Joe, tell me about Boxcar. Give me the pitch on, on Boxcar and, and yep. what, how you guys so, are doing with the world. So Yeah, so Boxcar is a marketplace, commuter, uh, marketplace company focused on commuters from the suburbs. Uh, so very niche sounding, uh, right? Uh, and so our original business line was Airbnb for parking, just like 500 other people had tried. Uh, we made this work with um, just focusing on suburban train station parking. And so mm-hmm. in a lot of these suburban towns that are outside of what we call legacy transit cities, these are transit cities where the suburbs developed before the automobile. So that's like New York, Chicago, D.C., Boston, Philly, and San Francisco, really just those six cities. Outside of there, these towns uh, built – around train stations. And so what that means is that if you wanted to build a church or a butcher shop, uh, you built it near the train station. And so all of this real estate became super valuable or an apartment building uh, right near the train station. And now that all of the rest of the town has been developed and all the other towns that don't have train stations also have residents, it's very hard to park near those train stations. And so what we do is we we solve that problem by partnering primarily with uh, civic organizations. So uh, churches, Uh, VFWs, Elks Lodges, Uh, these are properties that were built near the train station maybe 100 years ago, and they've got parking lots of their own, and they don't need them Monday through Friday for the most part. So we take their parking, we rent it out to commuters, commuter pays six bucks, we take $1.50, the rest goes to the organization. Uh, This was a decent growing business, it was never going to put anybody uh, on the cover of an entrepreneur magazine with uh, SBF. But like, you know, it's going to uh, pay the bills, uh, it was keep on growing, we were going to be able to take our kids to Disney World and uh, like really um, just have a steady, calm business. Uh, so, the pande- so we also had a luxury bus service that went into Manhattan. It was super niche. We didn't really focus on expanding it. It was more expensive to expand because we had to pay a fixed price for the bus and then we didn't make money until the tickets uh, exceeded that cost around maybe 30 yeah. riders a day. So, you know, fast forward to 2020, I've been doing this for three years. Uh, we're doing a decent business. We're doing 200 grand a month. We get to keep 40 to 50 of that, and our monthly expenses are 40 to $50,000. So uh, it's calm, we're growing, you know, we're expecting that we'll, we'll hit uh, $300,000 by the end of 2020 without growing any expenses. So turning a decent profit, being able to invest in other, you know, hires to do the things that I don't wanna do, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, so 2020 comes along, nobody gets hit really harder than commuter focused businesses, which was us entirely. We fall off a cliff, we go down to zero revenue, we are staying at zero revenue for the foreseeable future. Uh, so we take our app uh, and we focus on a number of other services. Uh, and now fast forward today, we're doing all right. Uh, parking yeah. is back a little bit. Um, bus service is kind of through the roof. It's it's an opportunity now to really grow that business line. So okay. uh, for now, if you're looking at Boxcar, you are, if you're using Boxcar, you are primarily using us as a way to get to your office in Midtown Manhattan in a much more convenient, reliable, safe way than you might otherwise be able to do. Yeah. Very cool. That's really interesting. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Joe. <laughs> so where's it going in the future? Tell me about, tell me about where, you, you spoke about having yeah. a kind of a marketplace to find other services, all that sort of thing. I think when we spoke a little bit ago. Yeah. So, you know, we think that, so the, the opportunity, the, the opportunities we pursued during the pandemic were uh, myriad, anything to keep my team together and my business alive. So initially that was boxes of groceries and we partnered with grocery uh, wholesalers who had no clients because they usually sold to restaurants, schools, cruise ships. Uh, and at the same time, it was hard to get groceries at like a grocery store. Uh, we were doing these drive throughs where you would order it in our app, just like you would normally reserve a parking space uh, and you would pull through and you know, you would, we would see your license plate and boom, in would go whatever groceries you ordered. Um, and we were doing this 
really big business there. You know, we were doing um, like a hundred thousand dollars in a week uh, for so, mm-hmm. for some of these for a little while. We pivoted. Uh, we did drive-in movies. Acquired a ton of customers. We did mobile auto detailing, which we still do today, where we come to your house and you know that's where we partner with a merchant who does a very good job with detailing cars in people's driveways, and he sells through our app. People reserve, uh, and we give him you know over eighty-five percent of the revenue. Um, but we help with the customer service and the technology. Uh, mm-hmm. We do Santa Claus appointments, and we've done you know, over a hundred thousand dollars worth of Santa Claus appointments, and we just released cool. uh, today you know the twenty twenty two version. Um, and you know, there we partner with a local civic organization who does this, uh, yeah. and we, you know, they got a small fee for the customer service and the technology, but, um, you know, so I view this really as a uh, long-term building a, an American express that's focused on the suburbs. So an American express original model was like, you're a member and upon your membership is conferred certain advantages, opportunities means that your credit is good enough that you can walk in and pay with this piece of plastic and settle up with American Express later, right? Mm -hmm. That's when credit cards weren't as uh, ubiquitous as they are now. And so most of our customers right now pay us a $30 monthly membership fee. Uh, And for right now, that gives them good discounts on our bus tickets, our parking. It gives them better access to Santa Claus appointments and uh, Mm -hmm. mobile auto detailing and knife sharpening and all these other things that we have that usually are scarce and sell out. They get the first crack at them. And so now I have this really uh, superb customer base because they're paying uh, more money for their daily commute. They're paying for a little bit of a nicer parking experience that's reserved in advance. You know, and, and so who else wants to um, you know, sell to this customer base? Well, it's every single company out there, right? And so for all these small companies in the suburbs, uh, you know, whether it's an HVAC company or a coffee shop, they don't have the resources to compete with um, you know Starbucks when it comes to tech development, and they don't have the opportunity yeah. to you know some of them are sometimes in the middle of doing work and they're getting a phone call from a new client. Um, they don't have the time to schedule that or, or take the, they have to choose between doing the work or dealing with the, the customer service. And so I would like to say you know this is a great customer base. They're very loyal to Boxcar. They've already got their saved home address, payment information, uh, vehicle, and wouldn't it be great if you know, you could sell your services, doesn't matter what it is, you have firewood delivery, plowing a driveway to this customer. And at the end of the day, Boxstar doesn't really need to make money on this. We need to offer these services in such a way that it delights customers um, and that they keep their membership. Uh, yeah. And that would fully align our vision, you know, our, our business with our customers. The people who are paying money to us at the end of the day should also be the ones who are bankrolling uh, our business. Um, yeah. Not, you know, some sort of like captive audience, like somebody searching on Amazon, who's now getting bombarded with a thousand ads for the cheapest, you know, product that's going to break the third time they use it. So that's my vision long term is an opportunity to take this customer base and give them everything that they need, create a super app for the suburbs. Um, and then, you know, maybe it's a different uh, venture, but eventually create new suburbs. So it's almost like I couldn't help but draw the analogy to like Costco. Like you have all these people that pay a membership to Costco and then Costco's like, I'm going to go out and barter for all of these like really good prices, really good products. And like you're serving them. So Costco knows they make a bankroll on all these membership fees. So they're like, I'm going to do what's best for them. And it's so, it's such a, maybe this is a, not a good analogy, but no, it is. it's funny because it runs in such contrast to when you have someone that's in the store trying to sell you something like a, sometimes they have like someone that's trying to push like a credit card or like AT&T yeah. or something. And it's like, that's like the banner ad on Amazon. You're like, you're, you know, like the reclick ad is like, oh, I don't want that. Like, no, I want all these things that are actually like valuable to me. Does that make sense? You know, like, <laughs> uh, it makes total sense. It's a great analogy. And I, I always wonder, I'm like, why, why isn't anybody else doing this? Yeah. Why isn't anybody else like just focused on keeping their customer base a little smaller than it would be otherwise? Yeah. Uh, you know, reducing their customer service complaints from people who are always going to cause trouble. Um, and you know, just making it so that you can delight your customers in more ways than one. And th- the short answer is, uh, that I've come up with is like, there, there's no legitimate reason for this other than the idea of these like SaaS companies became so attractive, you know, uh, VCs thought that they had created alchemy. Mm-hmm. Um, you could come up with a SaaS company that's charging a $35 or $3,500 monthly fee, uh, invest in them and get them to, you know, permeate the market quickly. But this is going to take a long time is the other thing, right? A lot of entrepreneurs are very impatient. Uh, the, the vision that I'm laying out, it's, I'm building a chicken and egg marketplace. And right now it's hyper managed. Mm-hmm. I am, I'm unable to say, you know, just go buy eggs off the shelf like Costco uh, at a great discount. 
and you know sell them to people who are already in my store i have to really manage these relationships yeah but you know as our software as our customer base grows as our revenue grows our software will also improve we'll be investing in that uh, as our software improves it'll allow us to add, add more vendors with less uh, rigmarole um you know as we add these vendors with less friction we'll be able to add, acquire more customers so I don't think we're going to see most of our growth until five years from now. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so that's, but yes, it makes perfect sense. Just make your customers happy and charge them a little bit of money. Yeah. So you guys have like funding, you guys are profitable now or like what, how do you get to that five years? How do you span the five years? Yeah. So right now we are uh, profitable. Okay. Uh, So uh, squeaking by on a little bit of profit. We did do a fundraising. Uh, We raised about $750,000 earlier this year. Okay. And that was really because we saw the opportunity of the transit and the the window is open right now where we can go to a new place and we can launch a bus uh, in the morning and it goes all the way, you know, it goes Wi-Fi power outlets, goes across 42nd Street all the way up Madison Ave. Big, big appeal is that it skips the subway for people, right? The subway is not a great place. Um, Our ridership has gone from 20% female pre-pandemic to 55% female now. So, uh, and anecdotally talking to our customers, they say it's because, you know, well, I'm a, I'm a small woman. I'm, I'm petite. I don't want to be on the subway. I, I felt very uncomfortable being on the subway the last few times I'm on. So I'm always going to take boxcar. Um, and so this is our, you know, it's kind of our window of opportunity to say, okay, like now's the time to launch new routes mm-hmm. in terms of funding. Like there's a world where we take funding. Um, we're still a few weeks, maybe even months away from like figuring out whether we can take a dollar and make a dollar 50. Right. Uh, that's where we were pre pandemic. We could take a dollar, um, you know, spend it on acquiring parking spots and then spend uh, it on acquiring parkers and we can make a dollar fifty. We are not yet at that point where I can confidently raise a couple million dollars and say, yes, we can like hypothecate money uh, mm-hmm. from new routes, but uh, we may be there soon. Okay, very cool. So what do you see? So I want to I want to kind of ask where it, the next five years, what do you see macro trends that are going to lead to your growth? I mean, one of the things that you and I have talked about via Twitter and stuff is what's going on in the world, right? Like all of these. Yeah. I mean, that, that could be a three hour conversation. But what, what do you see in terms yeah. of macro trends that play into boxcars growth and just generally um, in the in the climate? So we have always somewhat thrived in crisis, Um, whether it, you know, we started our bus when a train line went down for the summer and they no longer serve Manhattan. So we launched it. We said, these people are going to be looking for a new way in. Um, Why not start a public transit, uh, you know, company or a private transit company? Um, And then anytime that there's been, you know, like a, a tree falling on the train tracks and all of a sudden service is suspended on that train line. Well, we can, t- you know, we can go to our bus companies and say, instead of running four buses this morning, we're going to run 12 mm-hmm. and we are going to get uh, a lot of new customers. And then a lot of them are going to stay with us after this crisis has passed. And so macro trends, uh, I think it's almost impossible to predict what's going to happen like two years from now. Right. Yeah. Um, but people's faith, uh, the loss that, of faith that people are having in uh, experts and the government and all these other things uh, is correspond it's not you know coming out of some uh, insidious campaign to disillusion people it's coming out of uh, a loss of uh, like a desert like a deserved loss of trust like yeah. people are letting us down again and again and again they just keep on like letting us down it's coming out of firm uh, data points that are happening real time right <laughs> yeah exactly i always say you could uh like uh, in in march 2020 i remember uh, tweeting like you can draw a straight line from uh you know jimmy carter abolishing the civil service exam um, as a requirement to advance in the civil service to uh, what is going to be a colossal mishandling of the pandemic, yeah. right? What happens when you know, oh, we said, hey, like we're a post merit society, yeah. um, you know, so we don't need to promote based on merit. We can predict, promote based on the whole human. Yeah. Um, well, it's great as long as you have no pandemics and you're infinitely rich. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the, you know, the, uh, where are things going? I think there's going to be crisis. So like I'm focused on every few uh, weeks adding some new buses, yeah. either to our existing line or a new location. Um, but w- what do I expect going to happen is that um, there's going to be a transit strike. And yeah. everybody says, well, obviously what's going to happen with the transit strike is that 
you know, we're going to have a transit strike. And within a few hours, Congress is going to come in and they're going to say, nope, transit strike's over. And I'm like, have you seen Congress? Th yeah. This Congress? Like, yeah. uh, you, so you think they're going to just have their act together this one time? Uh, <laughs> maybe. Maybe they will, right? Like, maybe they'll have their act completely together. 20% um, chance they don't, right? 20% yeah. chance that, like, the strike goes on. And what does that mean? It's going to shut down massive uh, amounts of commuter rail as well, like a number of lines in Chicago, yeah. uh, Boston. Um you know, and then some uh, out in like Seattle. Yeah. So there's a crisis. There's an opportunity. Um, there's a lot of companies that have bulked up and you know taken on debt and uh, absorbed other companies. Uh, private equity money is not flowing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Asterix really fun story is a lot of it is not flowing because of the Twitter deal. It is so large and it printed at such a low yield mm. that, and then yields moved so, so much higher and the, the deal became so less attractive that banks have kept it on their books, which has eaten up all their private equity deals for like uh, budgets. Mm. Um, so it's fascinating because the entire global world of private equity has shrunk uh, significantly. So, you know, there are these companies that are not focused on serving customers. Um, they're focused on like, you know, uh, in New Jersey specifically, a lot of these transit companies are focused on receiving state and federal dollars. And then, you know, they do a really bad job with customer service. Um, a lot of them are on tenuous footing right now. They didn't receive a lot of that uh, bailout money that was given out to the yeah. public transit agencies. Um, are they going to make it? The public transit agencies themselves, as you've seen from Twitter, like I've been really digging into their annual reports. Yeah. Uh, they themselves are saying they run out of money in 2024 to 2025. Yeah. Um, now, in the past, that has always uh, coincided with the time when the federal government and state governments are in positions to bail out their you know, beloved and important tra public transit agencies. What if they can't? Um, what if it happens to arrive at the same time when there's such a budget crunch at state and local governments uh, and federal government that you know, th those dollars aren't there? What decisions are they going to make? So, you know, from macro trends perspective, we're in growth mode. I'm in steady growth mode, maintaining some cash buffer. And uh, I think that if you if we talk a year from today, we'll be like, yes, there was uh, things were going steadily. And then can you oh, my God, remember what happened in February of 2023? Huh, I can't believe like, you know, innocent Joe from November of uh, 2022, yeah. you know, I had no idea what, what uh, shit storm he was about to step into. Sorry, I don't know the rating of yeah. this is but um so yeah I, I think the macro is uh the better you are at get, dealing with crises if you can turn a crisis to from a disadvantage to a slight advantage you know one percent loss versus one percent gain uh you're going to have a very good couple next years yeah. uh, and that's what that's what we're focused on is steady business hope no crises come but if they come we should be in a position to uh grow rather than shrink as a result yeah, which it sounds like you guys have your eye on those macro trends and you have a, you have a history of thriving in crisis. So it kind of bodes well for future if those were to happen. So you said, I want to back up to what you said about the Twitter deal because I, I was a little bit, I, that made that one over my head. But you said, tell me how that um, tied into the private equity markets and, and what, you know, explain that a little bit like I'm five. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Two Cent Dad podcast. I wanted to take just one minute to tell you how this show is possible. And that is through my business, EC Group. We help software companies get more done by building them amazing developer teams. Now, those teams come alongside their in-house developers to help them build more and build faster. We are a purpose-driven company, which means that we use our profits to help support nonprofit work in the locations that we operate. We operate in the U.S., in Michigan, and also in Chennai, India. You can check us out at teamwithec.com. Again, that's teamwithec.com. So if you're hiring software developers or you know someone that's hiring software developers, check us out. Love to talk to you. Yeah. Um, so if a bank's able to do uh, $100 billion of uh, private equity or $10 billion in private equity for the year um, or keep $10 billion of private equity uh, on their books mm -hmm. at any given time, um, in February, March, whenever the whole thing went down, a number of banks signed commitments to Elon Musk saying, we will back this private equity deal and we will do it at a 3.8%, whatever, 3.8% uh, rate. Um, because it was February, March, 2022 when the prime 
rate was, you know, around 1% uh, from the Fed. So, or 1.5%. Uh, so, uh, fast forward to everybody thinking, oh, well, the deal's fall, falling apart. Well, now it's back on. Well, now it's off. But Twitter's trying to force it to be on. Uh, so, this took like 10 months to get done. And uh, in those 10 months, the Fed continued raising rates to meet, you know, uh, to conquer the specter of inflation. Well, now a private equity deal would normally price, you know, two and a half, three percent above, like, like a, a tier A private equity deal would, would price a, a few points above prime. Well, now prime's at what, four, seven, five. So now they're looking at seven, eight, nine percent uh, yield on this. And now everybody's saying that Twitter's about to die in the next few hours. Uh, like uh, the, these banks, if, if they, uh, but they were still obligated at closing to meet that whatever 3%, 4% uh, closing cost, mm -hmm. uh, 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 rate at closing, even though at closing, none of them would ever have made that loan uh, regularly. Yeah. So right now they're sitting on these loans that are meant to be paid back by Twitter. Um, and in, do, in sitting on them and being unable to sell them because if they turn around and sell them, they're going to lose 20% yeah. of their, you know, $10 billion investment. Um, and by holding them on their books, it means that when somebody else comes along and says, Hey, I want to do this deal. I, you know, I own a, uh, a pipe manufacturing company. There's another pipe manufacturing company. I'm profitable. They're profitable. Uh, it's like a straight stick, normal private equity deal. The bank has to say, I'm sorry but we can't, mm. uh, we are currently sitting on like a hundred percent of our private equity yeah. funds either for the year, uh, because we have an annual, annual budget for the year or because, uh, we are sitting on this $10 billion potential time bomb that we're all getting skittish about. Yeah. Um, we cannot finance your pipe fitting companies acquisition, private equity, uh, acquisition of another pipe fitting company. Yeah. Um, and in just talking with some friends who are in private equity, they are saying, you know, a combination of rising rates and the Twitter deal um, has basically seized the entire market um, for those who don't have, you know, cash to do wow. to do these deals. Which I look at that as like, you know, even firms like Boxcar, or even like, you know, we're we're not reliant on outside capital. Like that kind of is is ripe for you know those type of players to come in and like make some moves because you have all these some of these companies that are reliant on just a steady stream of capital. They're not profitable. That causes a bunch of issues, you know, and you're seeing that in the tech layoffs and that sort of thing that are going around right now. So it's really fascinating to see what's going to happen over the next 12, 12, 18 months, you know? Yes. Uh, it's time to grow for some people, right? Yeah. Um, it'll, it'll be certainly a time of consolidation. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you look at these, like, like the SPACs and you're just like, wow, like, I wonder if it was worth it, you know, like to go public and get whatever money you got. And now your company is about to get delisted from NASDAQ because it's trading at like 20 cents. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fascinating time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, what do you think is going to happen over at Twitter? Cause it's funny to see that kind of transpiring yeah. and there's, everyone's kind of getting all upset at Elon for like actually make people work hard and getting rid of the fluff, you know? Yeah. What do you follow this guy who talks about, um, not the, he doesn't talk about the. He talks about the swarm. Do you know that guy? Okay. Not ringing a bell, but okay. So he's always talking about the swarm, and you know, like this is like a swarm. The the response to the Ukraine war was a swarm, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody came out and was like, "You need to um, take away the license for uh, Luke Oil affiliates in Newark who are owned by Bangladesh immigrants to do business." But like the Newark Council, like just did it, right? They were like, like, oh, we heard Luke Oil's bad. Like, we're shutting down these gas stations. You're, it's, you're, you lost your license for to do gas station. And these Bangladesh immigrants are like, why? Like, what? Like, we don't give Luke Oil a penny. Like, we can change our name. They're like, nope, you're done. You're out. Um, and so, like, between that and like McDonald's shutting down and all these other things, like Biden wasn't behind the scenes, like saying, like, hey, you got to like McDonald's, you got to get out of Russia. Like, this was just uh, a swarm, mm -hmm. right? And so it was like the the same swarm. Uh, like what, what's a good one? Like when, like an early, early version was like me too, right? This was like yeah. a righteous swarm because like people, uh, and, and like it went after like Harvey Weinstein, right? But then like the swarm, like got Harvey Weinstein, uh, rightfully. And they were like, all right, like, what do we do now? And they're like, just keep on yeah. like destroying stuff. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, the, the idea of this is like once 
Elon bought Twitter and he said, go out and vote Republican. You know, I'm voting Republican, by the way, yeah. this year. Um, the swarm was like, OK, well, we don't need a leader to like fund it. We don't need Soros behind the scenes to like come out and attack Twitter. Like we are just like we're, we're on. It. We're getting it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's fascinating because it's the world's like richest, most, you know, he's guy launches rockets. Uh, he could blow up your city if he wants. Like, um, <laughs> you could only do it once, and then they would you, you wouldn't have much go. But like, you know, he's a very powerful, and he's a, he was the world world's richest man. Like, uh, he could just like turn off all all our cars yeah. if you have a Tesla. Um, and you know, it's him versus this like network swarm of people who really like made Twitter the place it was. You know, uh, a lot of these like I, I don't think anybody wants to like be on a all right, like conservative version of Twitter, like there'll be nobody to dunk on, you know? Um, and so it, it's just, it's fascinating to play out. I have no idea what, it, what is going to happen. You know, I, I wouldn't bet against Elon uh, for a minute, but I mean, the, the economics of the debt that he has to pay uh, for Twitter, I just don't see, I don't see how he pulls it off, but yeah. he has uh, surprised me to the upside many times in the past when I thought, well, uh, you know, Tesla's going to dive. Like it's com completely uncorrelated to the underlying value of the company. You know, time to short Tesla. Well, there it goes up another two hundred percent. What do I know? And, so, and it seems like he's, uh, we'll he's the the direction from from rockets and and cars. So like hardware to software seems like it would be an easier transition, right? <laughs> he's not manufacturing yeah. physical goods. <laughs> like at least he's got <laughs> that going for him, right? You know, it's easier to <laughs> easier to swing the other. I always that. say, yeah. I do say that about myself too, like uh, not to compare us to, but like, I'm always like, man, like in my next life, uh, for my next act, I will be doing a pure software play, yeah. like uh, running buses, you know, uh, it's just doing things in the real world is, it, it, it'll put years on you. Yeah. Um, so speaking of which, how, how do you see the relation between, you know, what's going on with um, FTX and, um, and Twitter? Is that a coincidence with Elon, with... All, I mean, it's just bananas. I cannot keep up with it. And I think, Joe, you're, you're, a, you're a force for uncovering a lot of facts related to this. But, you know, the, the crypto exchange, FTX, like, that, that I'm sure most people that are listening to the podcast are probably aware of, um, is imploding. And there's all these implications now that there's left, you know, Democratic, you know, um, connections. And all. It, it's kind of like every time you turn over a rock, like some other thing is there that it connects them to some rabbit hole. And I think my perception as as an outsider that's maybe uneducated on some of that stuff is you start to lose sense of okay who's actually legit in unearthing some of these things but the sheer frequency of them and the sheer number of like valid data points gives you enough caution to be thinking that something is really amiss here <laughs> and yeah. and it, i don't know but get your mind going so uh, to summarize the theory that i've heard it is uh Sam Bankman Fried uh, was a n nobody, but he had a dad who wrote, uh, was often cited, you know, he's, he was at MIT with Gary Gensler. He was Gary Gensler's boss. He was uh, often cited as, uh, you know, a person who was crafting the way that crypto policy should be created and crypto companies should be regulated. And then his mom was a specialist at bundling large donations for Democrats. Um, and then, uh, he, out of nowhere comes, uh, he goes to Sequoia yeah. and he's able to raise like a, a billion dollars, whatever, a couple hundred million dollars from Sequoia, um, with the, what, what seems to be a pitch for, uh, we're going to have a crypto exchange, which like, there, there are a lot of crypto exchanges. Yeah. Why, like, how do you succeed in 20, uh, and I figured, well, maybe FTX had been around a while. I've been in crypto a while. I don't pay attention to any new developments uh, of like new exchanges coming, they come and go. So I figured FTX had been around a while, but no, it, it started in 2020, you know? And, and so the theory is, well, it started the week after Biden announced his candidacy. Um, and then, you know, he received all this money a few weeks later. Now all the money is gone, but, you know, tens of millions have been verifiably sent to Democrat candidates. Um, and uh, I, don't, I mean, the the theory makes sense like it, but it, it's you know it makes it makes um so like you have motive you have means uh and you have no evidence mm -hmm. so i don't know like i don't know like that's what we have a lot these days mm -hmm. right 
is we have these stories where like, well, I see the motive. Like I see why this would happen. Like I see the means, like I see the, like the means to make this happen. Right. Um, that like, uh, and, and I have zero evidence and like, how am I going to find evidence? Like you can do on chain transactions, but if like somebody just has a private wallet somewhere and they're running, you know, Bitcoin QT, like you don't know who owns that wallet. Yeah. Like it's all, it's all in the ether. So, um, just like add this to the growing list of things where we're like, this smells, uh, this smells funky. Um, and you know, a lot of people who are also saying that like there were, crisis actors in Sandy Hook are saying that this is going on. And like, so I'm disinclined to believe them. Um, but then a lot of people who are like, you know, uh, Biden is going to the teachers unions to craft his school choice uh, and school reopening policy are saying this. And they were right when they were called conspiracy nuts, uh, right. when they said that the you know, teachers unions were writing, like it, it all turned out to be true. Um, so I, yeah, it's uh, do your own d due diligence, caveat emptor. Um, what a world though. I mean, yeah. uh, that, that, that we're even, you know, very uh, normal people. And then, you know, New York times comes out and they're like, what a nice guy this Sam guy was. Right. What is like, it? It's, that? So unfortunate it's what like all these him. fluff pieces. It's like, I, how is this? I, even if, if you're running this campaign, you, it's like obvious, right? It's like you seems like you would do it a different way. <laughs> the New York Times has been has done nothing but dump on crypto for years, exactly. and now suddenly there's like an intersection of like crypto and uh, Bernie Madoff, and they're like, well, like finally some nice stuff happening here. Like let's give it a the kid glove treatment, and it just makes you very incredulous. Yeah. So, so I, what really fascinates me, and I don't know that I have conclusions on this, Joe, is like the, the public sediment, like you're saying, is there's this distrust of institutions. There's this distrust of experts. But it, it's, is that just an echo chamber of people that are, quote, paying attention? And then you have these other folks that are kind of just going along with it. Or, are they, or is it more of a, what can I do? You throw up your hands and you just kind of check out. And... And the, the long-term implications of that are very interesting to me, and I don't know necessarily what they are, but you see that manifest itself in just people opting out more of the traditional institutions. You know, my, you know, we homeschool our kids, so that's part of it, right? People are saying, you know, these institutions that are that, that are just going to put my kids right up in through these these you know indoctrination schemes or whatever, I'm gonna I'm gonna opt out. So that's like clear data points to say this is how people are responding. I don't like the yeah. fact that it's like, oh, we just have some savior Trump, you know, is going to come in and fix everything. It's like, yeah, that didn't work out well before, right? So, um, it's it, it's just yeah. interesting to me. It, I don't I don't know what those long term long tail things are, but it, it's it's accelerating. It's like the last you think of. Okay, if it if it really happened, started with COVID, it's been nonstop since, and the trust has continued to decline, and there's continual perma crisis. Meanwhile, it seems like. They're just getting away with murder, you know, literally with Epstein. You know, it's like, so what, where does this lead? A disenfranchised yeah. nation to tyranny? You know, it's got all these like conspiracy guys are like, oh, they're going to just send us off to camps. It's like, well, I don't, how does that actually logistically work? I the, don't <laughs> yeah, the, the Epstein thing is so funny, right? Because like for a while you were like a conspiracy theorist. If you're like Epstein's flying people to an island and like he, you know, the, and, and it's an op, uh, for either like Israeli or U S intelligence to like get dirt on people and, and leverage. And now that's like, um, as crazy as it sounds like that's the kind of the base case with Epstein, right? Like that's what was going on. That's why we don't have a client list. Um, but like the really funny thing about Epstein is that the, like when that guy was getting interviewed on the news and uh whatever he was getting interviewed about like the paycheck protection program payment whatever who was getting and interviewed? he's like Eps um what's who that was getting interviewed was it epstein getting interviewed or who's saying no no uh like a plumber yeah. like like oh, a yeah. like a, a craftsman yeah. of some kind um and they were like i forget what they were talking about but he's like uh epstein didn't kill himself uh, at the end of the interview yeah. right and the host is like okay well and like now it became this like famous punchline where like of course he didn't like uh, everybody know like the the guards uh, were, you know, away from the cell when they weren't supposed to be. The cameras got turned off. And so it is like an interesting thing. Like, uh, cause like, you know, normally I'd be like, Hey, like I've got a customer base. Like, I don't really want to like say anything controversial and you bring up Epstein and I don't want to get involved in it. But like, uh, no, like, uh, everybody knows Epstein can kill himself. Yeah. 
like everybody, right? Like nobody's out there like, well, he's, you know, he found rope and he just like, he got, got it. Like, so it is a weird thing but to be so No one's even supporting it is what you're saying. They're not even attempting to support a plausible yeah. scenario where that happened is what you're saying. And and so what are the implications? Exactly. Uh, so there's this Wayne, what, what, what's that Gelman effect? The, the one where if you see a news story that you know intimately well, you uh, realize that like 80% of it is wrong, right? Yeah. Like the, the reporter yeah, just definitely. like didn't know what they were talking about. Um, I'm going to look that up. Uh, but it's uh, it's this effect of effect news, Gelman amnesia maybe it is. Yeah, the Gelman amnesia effect. And so uh, if you like see a New York Times article about yourself, you'd be like, yeah. wow, like they got 75% of it wrong. And then the next thing you do is you go, you read a New York Times article about the oil crisis. You'll be like, wow, like this is this is what's happening in the oil crisis. Yeah. Uh, and you will no longer give the 75% discount. You won't take the 75% discount that you've learned firsthand yeah. uh, and apply it to everything else that you consume. And so I think that that's kind of like what's happening societally, right? It's like we know that like a couple things were like really nefarious and like plotted and bad. But we still, in this sort of like gel man amnesia moment, like we still give everybody else, everything else, the benefit of the doubt. Mm. Um, and I think that's uh, that's like a human nature thing. Is that changing though? Do you think that's just continuing to happen? Because more and more, it's. I think there's two light. things. Yeah. Yeah. So two things happening. The first is like people are losing faith, right? And they're like choosing to do things. Um, out of so there's uh, loyalty, voice, and exit. These are the these are the three things that we can choose when dealing with um, a a system or an institution, right? Loyalty is I'm going to just go. I'm going to work within all the rules. And if suddenly like the water gets a little bit warmer the next day, I'm just going to keep on working within the rules. Uh, and then like maybe you know you just keep on working within the rules until uh, the water's boiling, and then you oh my gosh I'm too late. Uh, then, you know, voice is when you're like, Hey, like I'm, I'm in Cranford, I'm having problems with what's going on in the school system. I want to talk to you about it. I want to change things. You know, it's, it's the effort to change things in, in your surroundings, in the system that you believe are unfair, wrong, immoral. Uh, and then exit is, you know, goodbye. I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now homeschooling, I'm moving to the country. I am leaving the Democrat or Republican party. I am you know, leaving America to go to a non-extradition country of Bali, like that guy in the news the other day. Um, so like, it, it's a, you know, the, the, fundamentally, I think a lot of people are moving from, uh, have moved in the last five, six years from loyalty to voice. Very few people have moved from voice to exit. Um, and as, you know, as the friction for going to exit continues to fall, with, uh, I believe, remote work, you know, opportunities only just beginning. Even though people are back in the office now, I think long-term remote work is going to be a much bigger deal uh, even than it is today or was during the pandemic because those were not remote first jobs. They were, yeah. you know, temporarily remote jobs, um, physical first. And so the whole structure was off. So, you know, as exit becomes more palatable, as the systems for um, people who homeschool their kids become more robust and for $29 a month, you can get, uh, you know, uh, a, a really great teacher in, um, you know, India to help you for two hours a day uh, with some awesome, you know, one-on-one -on -one stuff with your kid uh, that they're having trouble with. Uh, like there's just all of these opportunities that uh, the same driving force that has driven people to from loyalty to voice um, will in the future, as the barriers fall, drive people from uh, loyalty to all the way to exit. Um, and, you know, that's going to be a very interesting thing to see. The other thing I'm seeing is that people are going back to loyalty. Mm. Um, and it reminds me somewhat of that guy in the Matrix who, like, sells out the, like, the team. Yeah. And he's like, listen, like, just put me back in the Matrix. Like, I just don't want to remember that any of this ever happened. Like, yeah. I want to be there. Make me a celebrity. Make me rich. Like, I just, I just want to, I want to be happy. Yeah. Right. Um, and so there, like, there are these people where I'm like, you used to like complain a lot. Uh, like, you know, all this stuff that's going on. They're like, yeah, like, what, what am I, like, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, no, it's out of my, like, be angry that things are out of my control or like be happy that things are out of my control. So you think that's a, so the, is that the same as someone that's just like throwing up their hands? They're like, you know, I'm going to choose to be kind of ignorant. I mean, I think that's the line the guy in the matrix uses. He's like, ignorance is bliss, right? And and so yeah. is that a loyalty back to a certain um, entity that even though they know is is not, you know, just or, or 
or write or does all these nefarious things they're like well whatever you know i'm gonna i i don't care i'm gonna choose the is like lesser of two evils kind of complex going on or um yeah, hundred uh, percent. And and I mean, it's a choice I make. I'm like, listen, I'm not exiting, so I should express voice. Like, there there mm-hmm. are things that I'm going to express voice on, um, but like, uh, a lot of that is just like, you know, shouting into the Twitter void, which is you know pretty meaningless. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are some things that I like express voice with locally that um, you know I feel like make a big difference. I serve on some boards. I work. Uh, I've, I've, I have a volunteer position in town. Um, you know, pretty in- involved with my kids' education. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not, uh, you know, it, it's the, the free, once I've made the decision that I, I'm, I'm not leaving physically, um, my best chance is loyalty, right? Yeah. Like, what am I going to do? Become a, a local pariah? Like, of course not. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love Cranford. I really do. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to leave. Um, but if I went to voice on everything that I disagreed with, my gosh, I would uh, I would never get anything else done, you know. Right, right. And do do you think that's a small? Um, so th- there seems to be a voice. I mean, if you take it as simplistic as as left or right, there seems to be a lot of like the woke left culture that is very active and vocal. And there's there's been a silencing of any opposition because they're just like not wanting to get ruffle feathers. In, this is like several years ago, but it's kind of then reached a tipping point where they're like, OK, I'm going to make my voice heard in the school boards and all the stuff around, you know, all of the things that the, the woke agenda that's coming into to schooling. Um, is it is that. It, it, it's interesting to me that there's a, such a small, a seemingly small um, group that's causing such a loud voice, and it's and it's only able to be so loud because of the silence of of the majority that's just choosing loyalty or just throwing up their hands or whatever. Is it, do you do you get what I'm saying? And uh, I 100 percent get what you're saying. So uh, Taleb used to write on this about like the tyranny of the minority, and ha- um, you know he would always throw out his like mathematical equations mm-hmm. like you know one over sigma shows that you know um uh, a population of 11 percent that's highly devoted can change the course of a culture right yeah. and he would point to, to love would point to things like um you know the eradication of certain foods in like large parisian or, or large like uh, french cities where like 11 percent of the population was like muslim and they got like all right well I'm like no more pork in any of the schools um and so you know, there is that, uh, and, and that's of course, like I guess, um, Muslim would be like far right, yeah. um, you know, but like to the far left, like there is that same thing too, where like at first they're like, listen, uh, like if you don't, <coughs> if you don't think that like a man can be in a relationship with another man and you think they should be in jail for that, um, then like you're a bigot, uh, and you're like, that's a good point, like. I like that should be none of my business. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, love, like love, love the sin or hate the sin. Um, like, uh, and then they're like, well, like also, and then like, you know, they, they, they keep on saying things and you're like, I agree, I agree, I agree. And then you're like, well, like I've been agreeing with you a lot, but now you're talking about like my girls just getting like blown out of the water in swimming. And I guess I don't want to be the same person who didn't think that like those two guys could uh, love each other in their yeah. private homes and have a relationship. So I guess you were right on all those other things. Like, I guess you're right on this too. Um, but I feel a little uncomfortable about it. Um, and so that's what, you know, I, I've recently had to like go to bat for one of my kids who was asked to like read a book that uh, we thought was inappropriate. Yeah. Um, and I was able to be successful. And, you know, in talking to all these other parents, I was like, there is such a, uh, so like everybody agrees with me, probably 90% of the people, um, they were all like, can you believe this? And I was like, yeah, well, what are we going to do about it? They're like, well, I don't don't know. I guess we're going to read the book. Right. I was like, no, we're not. Um, of course we're not. Um, and so, you know, we ended up in this, this world where like, there's a, there's a really broad coalition of, you know, that's going to get 70 to 80% of people to sign on to his agenda, which is like, like, uh, take everything from those, like, signs that people put outside their house, like, mm-hmm. Black Lives Matter, hate has no home here, like, we believe in signs, like, we yeah, put that in the manifesto, and then, like, add to it, like, we think that you're perfect just the way that you were born, like, we think that, you know, uh, we want you to, you know, uh, make sure that you're, 
uh, protected from like people who are not uh, who don't have your best interests in mind. Like parents should have a voice in their kids' curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and so like there's this world where like those people can stand up with confidence and say, I think that you know my kids need the best shot at being happy and successful and whatever they want to be for the rest of their life. And like that means that if they're you know whatever if they're gay or they're straight or you know they're they're black or they're Hindu, they're they're always feeling fully accepted. But like, I need them to read the classics. Like, I don't have time for this other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, like, I need yeah. them to like learn math. And you're not teaching them math; you're teaching them this other stuff. Yeah. Uh, they need access to AP courses, and they've been doing a lot of homework, and they want to get better at uh, this thing. So, like, please give them this. So, there's a, there's a broad coalition opportunity there, and I think that uh, you know it, that seems to be the way that things are turning. Um, and if, if I were to make a prediction, it would be that. Uh, you know, the, the sort of like the woke stuff that, that people get very con concerned about uh, is gone. Like it, like it, like it goes, uh, it, it disappears just as fast as it came in mm. the vast majority of the country. Yeah. Um, and it will be led by um, parents who have kind of like hit their loyalty to voice threshold. Yeah. Which I like that three tiered flush, uh, you know, thresholds where it's like, okay, you see the mobilization between <laughs> the two or between the three. And um, those have good and bad implications. I mean, you could argue too that um, the exit, if you too have too much exit, then the, the existing system just kind of implodes, right? And that's that's not good either, right? So you have to have this yeah. this mix of people that are doing different things, and yeah, from a social contract perspective, and also from an economic one, right? I remember when David Tepper left New Jersey for Florida, our budget went down by one percent, wow. our state budget. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> so New York, New York spent it in the millionaire's tax. I guess they forgot that Connecticut and New Jersey exist. But um, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're always going after the most mobile people first. It seems. Yeah. Oh man. Well, th thanks for being on, Joe. I appreciate it. You know, I appreciate this conversation. I think we started. I was like, it was going to be introduction, and then just went sure. went into the conversation. So I think we'll just I'll record a little intro for the for the episode, but cool. pretty much include all that. Didn't get to talk much about parenting. I'm sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> Well, I think I wanted to talk about some of the macro trends and stuff. And I know you're a father of five kids. And so a lot of the stuff that you talk about is very, you know, close to your heart and, and you're, you're active in your community because you care about your kids. And, um, yeah, I think one of the things that I, I think just a belief that probably both of us share, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth is that, you know, all this cultural stuff starts in the home and I, and, and, and that's something why I'm so excited about doing this podcast is how to help fathers and, and mothers and, how do they understand what's going on? How do they maybe express their voice a little bit more? And how do you equip them? Because ultimately the changes in the home shape the culture, you know, it's the culture is downstream from the home. And so I, I strongly believe that there's been just a disruption in the home for a very, a very a reasons. And that's re led to what we kind of are seeing maybe oversimplification. You know, obviously there's other things at play, but yeah. Um, so anything we can do to kind of strengthen that? No, uh, I, I agree. I mean, we are in such a blessed position, right? Like we, we look at like what all the things that we've been given. And I would say like yeah, when people talk about like privilege, I'm the first to admit like I, I had the most privilege in the world because I grew up in a safe home. I grew up with loving parents um, who would do anything for me um, and, you know, gave me all the confidence. And, you know, you go through life and you meet people who had such, uh, you know, uh, worse, so much worse experiences uh, than I had growing up. And I don't know your your uh, uh, origin story, but, you know, uh, and, and the idea of treating them with compassion and, and doing everything that you can to break this like vicious cycle yeah. of abusive parents, uh, parents who are not loving, you know, just uh, like. Uh, which begets more and more of the same and, and you know, introducing love into that cycle, introducing confidence uh, and allowing those people to, uh, you know, start an, a new cycle with their kids in the future. Um, I think it's like the highest calling, yeah. uh, you, you know, and, and I, I love that you're pursuing it uh, and you're, you're putting your, you know, your money where your mouth is there. Well, thanks, man. Well, where can people find you, Joe? Um, I know boxcar.com, right? Boxcar.com and on Twitter at uh, It's Joko. All right. Well, cool. Well, thanks. I'll um, I'll put a lot of that stuff that we discussed in the show notes. And um, until next time, man. Cool. Thank you. Absolute All pleasure. Right. Until next time. Yeah. Cheers. So we'll cut it there. All right. Thank. Thank you for listening to the Tuesday Dad podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with another dad who you think would benefit. 
that's really the best thing you can do to help this show. It A, gets the word out, but B, and most importantly, it helps another father be better at his role as a father. And that's what this show, that's what this podcast, that's what the website, that's what the blog, everything exists for. So if you could, share it with another dad who would find value in it. You can always head over to the website, twocentdad.com, the number twocentdad.com. And if you have any feedback, feel free to email me, mike at twocentdad.com. I must also thank the sponsor, EC Group. If you're looking to hire software developers or you need extra development capacity, check out teamwithec.com. Thanks.